Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another pandemic edition of Bookstock, where everything is sanitized except the poetry. I'm your host, Brian Smolensky. We have a wonderful program for you tonight featuring the amazing work of not one, but two poets. But before we begin, I would like to thank our partners, the Norman Williams Public Library and Yankee Bookshop. A quick reminder, the chat room is now open. Please feel free to comment and ask questions throughout the reading tonight. All chats are monitored and recorded for quality assurance purposes. And who knows, your question may even be selected from the chat room and asked to our poets this evening. Good luck to you and to your question. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator. Madel Driscoll is the executive director of The Frost Place. She holds an MFA in poetry from Warren Wilson College and is the recipient of the Ruth Lilly Fellowship. She was a featured poet at Vanderbilt University's Millennial Gathering of the Writers of the New South. Her work has appeared in Poetry, Kenyon Review, All Shook Up, and the Cortland Review, among many others. Her full-length book of poetry, Talismans, is available from Hobblebush Books. She is the past winner of the Agnes Scott Writers Festival. Madel volunteers with poetry and art organizations and serves on several boards. She lives not too far away in Franconia, New Hampshire. Please join me in welcoming Madel Driscoll. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Brian, for that wonderful mm -hmm. introduction. And thank you for having me here tonight. It's a great pleasure to be moderating these two wonderful poets. You're going to have a great night with readings and just a little bit of question and answer. As I read these, it dawned on me that there are some uniting, not themes, but craft methods and elements that lend themselves. So tonight we're going to talk just a little bit of that in between the two readings. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Eva Khrushchev. She's a poet, translator, and educator. She has three books of poems in English of Annunciations from Omnidon in 2017, Contraband of Hopo, Omnidon 2014, Strata, Emergency Press 2009, also reprinted by Omnidon in 2018, as well as three books in Polish, Dobolek, Sopilik, and Furkot. Her book, Contraband of Hopo was translated into Italian by Anna Aresi and came out in Italy with Edzioni Ensemble in May 2019. She also translated selected books by Jack London, Joseph Conrad, I.B. Singer, and the book of selected poems by Jory Graham and selected poems of Kazim Ali. She's an associate professor of humanities at Colby College and her newest book of poetry, Mental Aviary, is scheduled for publication in 2022 by Omnidon Press. Please join me in welcoming Eva Cruchel. Hello, thank you so much, Model. I'm thrilled to be here and honored to read with Cleopatra. I will start uh, from my book uh, of Annunciations. My latest book was Omnidon Press. Um, and in this book, uh, I map the uh, biblical event of Annunciation onto current migration crisis. And uh, just like Archangel appeared to Mary, um, and he was the other, um, so um, I explored the question of yes. What does it mean to say yes to a stranger? And there are uh, various voices in the book, uh, the voices of refugees, migrants, uh, the bucks, uh, archangels, guardian angels. So there are material and spiritual forces. We are the bright. We were stuck for two days amidst the bombs in Ashrafia. A 10-year-old boy came in with a knife carrying a wedding dress. He cut the dress into many pieces and gave us each a piece. We wore it on our heads and went out into the streets. When snipers see it, they stop shooting. 
What if we crossed Europe in wedding dresses, our wavelengths stretching infinitely? Archangel appears to a migrant. Leaf towards endless leaf stretching waves. There is no lily, I say. His voice rushed. Take your child, take your SIM card and your rosary beads, photos and a radio, one plush toy. How could it be, I thought, but all I let out of me was, yes, be it done. I wanted his wings to carry me, but they flew on to the next household, bullets in his feathers. The enunciation did not recur, so I confused a smuggler for an archangel. The boat was inflatable unstable. Now, the procession of faces in the waves, staring into the house I knew nothing about. The sea was bound to shake. Volunteer, rough note. I am on the beach to a 70 irate young man. I keep calling doctors without borders. The doctors warn me against scabies. Men stand in a ring. They set their blankets on fire. I walk around hugging them. Will you marry me? One after another says. I implore them not to burn the beach. A 10-year-old boy approaches me. Smoke? Smoke, he repeats. The confusion is infinite. Finally, I get it, and we share a cigarette. Refugees poem. How long shall we float? Almost near a gleaming source of life, each wave a face, a wake? Had we perhaps entered the heart from the mouths of guns? The waves tightened over us. A wave spawns a face. A face spawns another face. Here you are, whisper the seaweed. You confused archangels with smugglers. You confuse psalm for hourglass. Holy trinities on trees remain silent. Give us back our identity, we implore the waters. Trapped, hums the voice in a wave, trapped by dust. As if another god. Will the god of coast guards take care of us? Only the violent can carry away the violence. How long shall we float on our dinghies, O oh Lord? When we floated in water, the Red Cross did not help us. The helicopters flew over us, took some photos for the news and took off. We have waited a long time, O oh God. Until when, O oh God? Tell us, until when? guardian angel of offering. We want God. Instead, we have the poor, gang rapes, prostitution in the camps. You have been told that most of them are young, strong, single men. 10,000 unaccompanied children had gone missing within Europe in 2016. The Pope says, migrants are not a danger. They are in danger. You have been told these men cut or burn the skin of their fingers not to be traced. There are children too, without hands to beg or pray. 
They are the invisible in these lines. They sit on an invisible stretcher and beat with their wings. They whimper. We want to adopt them, but they are uncatchable. Only the debugs remain. They borrow us as vessels to get to the shore. We have the poor with us, but we climb over them through the abstractions to our God. And now the eternal cramped into cutting vegetables, watering the meals. Banana, banana, set, set, halas, which means one banana per child. But they keep coming back for another, for their sister, brother, mother, grandmother, who are always sleeping. We keep saying to them, halas, done, finished. The kids give us a nickname, banana, banana, sep, sep, halas. Thank you for listening and I'll transition to other poems, my newer poems, but in between, I wanted to pay tribute to uh, an amazing Polish poet who just passed away uh, during Easter time in Poland. He was very well known in US, uh, nominated to Nobel Prize a few times, Adam Zagajewski. And uh, I, I was lucky to have a bit of a friendship with him. So I wanted to uh, read a poem that uh, conveys a bit of his gentle spirit, but also tender irony. Adam Zakajewski. Madame Death, I am writing to request that you kindly take into consideration an extension of my liability to the institution headed by you for so many centuries. You, Madame, are a master, a violent sport, a delicate axe, the Pope, velvet lips, scissors. I don't flatter you, I beg. I don't demand. In my defense, I have only silence, dew on the grass, a nightingale among the branches. You forgive it. It's long tenure in the leaves of one aspen after another, drops of eternity, grams of amazement, and the sleepy complaints of the poor poets whose passport you didn't renew. And I wanted to read at the end a few poems from my uh, working manuscript with a working title, Mental Aviary. Um, and it explores the culture of uh, diagnosis. Uh, mental diagnosis as applied to bird species, but also has other related themes of grief, loss. Consider a womb as a bird. One powder blue unfertilized egg and three bluebird nestlings. And we build small stations of dreams, fecundity, what is it? If she had a child, she would tell it these nesting boxes are about luck and timing, although best when they just transpire and we can proclaim a miracle and shun meticulous planning. But she tells an invisible child carrying her through the rivers that to be the mother of all means to dwell in sorrow and evanescence. A mother and a virgin in one is our ideal. So we overcome gravity with skies. And these bluebirds domesticated partially reproduce in our hands. Hands of a mother are a cradle and hands of a non-gravitational mother, a boat. Ancient Greeks believed the uterus had suckers. Imagine it as an octopus, 
or a cuttlefish. And that brings us to wetness. The nature of mother and the ocean are one. A womb, animal within animal. And because we are only able to understand analogically, a womb is also a vessel, wine skin, and a dove. Holy Spirit, fallopian tubes as wings. That's why shamans dress as birds to access the other world. What flutters? Mourning the loss. How long has it been since your loss? The man asked. No specific date. It happened imperceptibly, slow shrinking. There were no funeral rites, only art articles missing, confused parts of speech, making up words. She called friends' eyebrows eye bushes. She would brood over them, unable to decide the words to choose. Do you feel abandoned by God? The voice asked. How could I? She speaks in tongues now, but they flicker in the air. They burn her at the tip, disappear. Perhaps you could write a poem, the man asked in conclusion, as he had to attend to other deaths. And this is one of the diagnosis poems. So there is a person of a psychiatrist in the book. Marabou Stork, who vandalized my office. Your criminalization is coterminous to your victimization. It is repetition compulsion. Other storks bring babies. You have an ugly face and you defecate on your own legs after killing pretty flamingos. Freud, now extinct, called this process primary ego defense. With apologies, I prescribe a lobotomy. History of a goldfinch's madness. Turkish smugglers caught him in the wild and trapped him in a veiled cage hung in a cafe. Deprived of light, the goldfinch mourned his song a prayer of lament. Sorrow breeds melodies. Pipe smoke wafted through the room. The men meditated. They puffed nostalgic rings into the air. The goldfinch's plaintive song lingered and soared emphatically, reaching mates and meadows. What will warm up these darkened souls? We perfect our yearning by death. For the lack of a God, we distill visions from tiny throats. Your mother welcomes you with half-empty sugar packets in her palms. She takes them for dollars. They perch like fledglings. The puffs of white grace awaiting their take off. Can I hold them, you ask? And she slowly deposits them into your hands. Each grain of sugar carries a trajectory of longing. Like the centrifugal leaps of your mother's neurons make her grasp the inscape of. One needs to be an oracle to hear an oracle. Fight, flight, freeze. American bittern, play free stack with me till the sun sets and you merge with the reeds again. Elongate your neck, sway, the slow motion strutting of a baron on parade.
puff out your neck and inflate your food pipe like a hungry ghost of desire. Skulk, duck and preen, I am mesmerized. I follow you into the temple of cattails and bulrushes. We walk together stealthily and you point your beak into the sky and start hiccuping. I chant your book of hours at dusk, psalm of camouflage, till I get my citizenship. The ceremony is over and you fly off to another case. The droplets of anthem shine on my beak. And I wanted to end with a poem from Contraband of Hupo, um, also with Omnidon. And because it's a special request of a person who just contacted me, who has Polish origin, my dear friend, Karen Kovacic, hello Karen, who just asked me to read that poem uh, for her and her niece. And Karen has translated uh, amazing Polish poets into English. Um, Agnieszka Kuciak, Jacek Denel, and many others. So I want to read that poem for them. And this is from my second book in English in which I explore the theme of smuggling and what immigrants carried with them when they came to Ellis Island. I buy a sausage at the airport before I leave Poland. Kiełbaska, kiełbasa, kabanos, kabanosik. This, my transcontinental dowry, the sacrificial baby of my tongue. Foreign gods hover over us. If God lets my sausage in, I will eat it like a saint, wreathed in incense, circle a table with Gregorian chants. Folkberg variations. The baggage carousel spurts my luggage out. With an air of conspiracy, I transfer this sausage from my carry-on into checked luggage. I look around. I pray for my sausage while I move towards customs. The Angelus trickles. The Angelus salivates. Saint George is about to put his spear through a sizzling dragon. My luggage goes through a sausage scan. Can an old sausage be born young again? The officer pulls me aside. The officer holds my sausage to the light, his babushka trophy. It's a sealed sausage, I declare with pride. I've brought a new species, but you declared no meat, the officer says. Sealed sausage is not a meat. Sealed sausage is a sealed sausage. I say as the guardian angels swarm under the investigation of light. The officer blinks when I repeat with determination, a sealed sausage is a sealed sausage. He looks blinded. My hypnotic alliteration throws him back into the waters of his childhood where eels juggle Scottish dances. Oh, sweet detained sausage, saint of arrest, pray for us. May my new species have mercy on us, escape at the borders. Oh, oven bird, whose migratory song is a sausage, a sausage. A sausage. Dear sausage of martyrs, sealed patriarch, let the virgin liberty swallow it. Thank you so much. Wow. That was amazing, Eva. Thank you. I enjoyed that so much. I, I feel so familiar with it. And, uh, my own imaginary voice, which, as you can tell from my pronunciation during your during your introduction, sounds nothing at all like yours. <laughs> it's so wonderful and delicate. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. I was hoping that we could talk about of enunciations for just a few minutes. Mm. And uh, one of the things that I want to I don't like to throw out compliments, but I'm afraid I have to. One of the things that I want to compliment you on is the way that you approach this tremendous problem so that it's not it's not with a hammer or a feather. When you take a look at the crisis and the 
horrors that are happening. It's a really amazing thing to have finely wrought and deep poetry that is not too emotional. One of the things that I really loved about it, indeed its complexity, was the subtleness with which you represented the parts of the crisis and how rather than taking a bite of the whole apple, you're able to look at the stem and the peel and the flesh and the core from whales and seabirds representing to bodies on the beach and even shoes and clothes. Can you tell me just a little bit about how you came to that approach? It seems so perfect. Well, thank you. This sounds just um, better what I could describe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I was fascinated and obsessed, I could say at that time, with the crisis, especially in Europe and, and with influx of refugees and migrants to Lampedusa. And uh, I actually uh, almost went to Lampedusa myself, but we had family crisis at the time and I stayed home and took care of my dad. So I was, um, it was the summer and I was in Poland. And so there was this uh, desire in me to inhabit the voices. And that's why I have the variety of voices, but in a sense, I meant them less than uh, dramatic personas and more as em emblems of our time. And that's why the voices shift and are more like you were describing almost metonymies, parts of the whole, yes. and they are very provisional, which was a bit of a risk because they seem so disembodied, but in a sense, the refugees are disembodied and dispossessed. Uh, so there are almost the forces and uh, the fluctuation of spiritual uh, forces such as Dibak, which is the uh, dispossessed soul of a dead person, a person that died prematurely. Uh, it's associated with Jewish uh, folklore and, and mythology. And uh, that becomes sort of a, maybe a, a metaphor uh, of uh, migrants and refugees who are dispossessed and they are seeking justice. So even though in in uh, Jewish uh, mythology, the back is an evil possession. I wanted sort of to recuperate that voice and uh, present it as um, the voice that appeals to our conscience and seeks justice. Um, and so I think that, um, I think you were describing, right? The, 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 the rapistes, right? That um, was a bit of a risk because I was fearing um, the sentimentalization also, you know, I really wanted to pose questions without, I didn't have any answers. So, um, and, and I really grew up, you know, on what Szymborska said about poets, they are not politicians. So like part of a relief was like, I'm, I'm just responding. And, and obviously we cannot assure politics, but I, I wanted to exalt um, the, the human desire and the, 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 the displacement and exile uh, without, without um, sort of tiptoeing a little bit because I didn't want to be claimed by any you know, political sort of agenda. And this is difficult when we talk about um, the, the migrant crisis in Europe yes. and here in the US. So that's, you know, I don't know if I, Sort of answered your question, but this oh, is oh, you did, is, you did. This is a very profound question, which you know would probably yeah take a bit of meditation to to like give it justice. One of the things that I have to say that I really enjoy about the book is that it reads differently as a book. So all of it becomes a larger narrative, and it's a, you're able to bring together all of those properties when you read it as a book the different parts representing different things that are done so subtly that it just sort of builds up this wonderful metonymy and we get this fantastic picture. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was amazing. And I just want to remind everybody that um, there'll be a question and answer for both poets. So I'm not going to blab all the time. I just get this lovely squeezed in part between the two readings. 
I'm your palate cleanser. Think of me as parsley. At any rate, <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, it's it's a great joy to be able to do this. Thank you again so much. I Thank wish so that much. Uh, it's also very hard to read when you can't see the audience. Mm. And uh, I thought you did such a lovely job. It's so wonderful to Thank hear you your so voice. Much. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Thank you. Cleopatra Mathis, we're only half through, and we have the wonderful poems of Cleopatra, who's a, a very prominent figure in both my poetic mythology and uh, my craft studies. The Cleopatra is amazing. Cleopatra, I know that you see, you see me. I fought the laurel and the laurel run one this morning. I fought the laurel bush, and it sent me back in so it's been it's been a little bit of a day. I apologize for the, for the for that. I'm going to introduce Cleopatra, and then I hope she'll talk with me just a few minutes about her book, her new and selected. It's uh, truly amazing. Cleopatra Mathis was born and raised in Ruston, Louisiana, and has lived in New England since 1981. She's the author of eight books of poems. The most recent is After the Body. Poems New and Selected, published by Sarah Ben Books in 2020, and is a finalist for the New England Book Sellers Award for Poetry and the Eric Hoffer Award. Went to Tip the Boatman 2001, won the Jane Kenyon Award, and White Sea 2005 was a recipient of the New England Poetry Award. Other prizes include a Guggenheim Fellowship, two fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, and two Pushcart Prizes. Her poems have appeared wisely in journals, magazines, and anthologies, including The New Yorker, boy, I'm jealous of that, Three Penny Review, The Georgia Review, The Southern Review, Plowshares, Best American Poetry, The Extraordinary Tide, Poetry by American Women, and Why, Why Two Rocks 50, 50 Years of Poetry from the Community of Writers. The founder of creative writing program at Dartmouth College in 1982, she lives with her family in East Thetford, Vermont. Another little known fact about Cleopatra, she's why I'm here and not in Georgia, coming to the Frostways. It is such an honor to introduce you tonight, especially with your new and selected. Can we talk just a little bit about After the Body? One of the things that um, struck me as I, as I lived with uh, these two books for the last month was that both of them did this amazing thing with parts as a whole, sort of, sort of a metonymous thing. And what struck me was your masterful use of parts to be able to delineate between self and body and spirit in order to take a look objectively about what's happening. I don't know how you came up with that, but it was such a refreshing way to look at it. It seemed to really enable you when the poem was moving, to grow above it almost, way above the poem itself, creating something else in the air. Can you tell me just a little bit about how you came to that strategy, I guess? Well, I don't think it was so much a strategy as I just, um, I, you know, I think that for me, having been a really healthy person all my life um, and having had many people in my life who I lost and who were not physically able to continue uh, or whose lives were cut short, um, I always felt somehow outside that. Um, I even feel like there was a kind of arrogance in me. Um, my sense of self um, and my sense of my, I don't know, permanence even on this earth has always been really very strong. And my inability, I think, to see myself as being at the mercy of my body, um, I think that's been a big issue for me all my life. And now, as of about 10 years ago, when health problems started to plague me, um, I think that my first reaction was a kind of betrayal. 
have betrayal, that my body could turn against me, that I couldn't be who I had always been, uh, that I was at the mercy of my body. And so spirit and self became very, very much opposed to body in, in the way that I think, you know, my, the tension in me was through that sense uh, and because of that sense of helplessness in the face of the body's weakness. There's such wonderful tension created there when uh, the parts oppose each other. The innate tension that you have there, the stratification of it really works so well for those poems and keeps them just on the edge, very fierce. I'm not surprised that's the way I felt when I was writing. <laughs> well, um, it sure did come through. <laughs> but I think also, you know, I do wanna say that the whole book all my work, I think, going back to the very beginning, and I'll, when I read, I'm going to start with two very old poems that I think illustrate my preoccupation with the body from the very beginning. I mean, not just the body of the self uh, that the self carries around with it, but the body of the landscape, uh, which is also yes. been so important to me. And I, I think I see landscape as a living body. Um, and I respond to it as something that is genuinely speaking to me. Yeah. Absolutely. I, you can really feel that in all your work. It's, uh, it's embedded in there. And making the world so cunningly and having it be a part of that is one of the things that makes this book such a sweeping experience. I have to say that I've read all of, well, I haven't read all of Cleopatra's poetry. I've read all her published works. And um, she's, she's, one of the reasons that I came here to New England. It's been a great thing. But if you are able to read through in one sitting the new and selected, you'll come away with a, a wonderful depth and you'll be able to see these sort of tropes rise up. But they're more than tropes. The, the way that you're able to um, objectively look at things that most of us cannot, that achieving that separation is, is pretty amazing. Thank you. You're uh, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean for this to be uncomfortable. I'm just, a, I'm fanning a little bit. Sorry. No. <laughs> thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone in Bookstock, especially for allowing me to be here. And thank you in advance, Cleopatra, for your wonderful work and your reading. I'm going to sit back, relax, and really enjoy this. Thank you again. Thank you, Miguel. That was wonderful. Um, unusual to have a reading in which you start with a conversation. Um, but I'm very happy to be here. I want to thank Bookstock for uh, all the work for staying with uh, the program, even though we're in the middle of a pandemic or maybe at the end of a pandemic. Um, and also, uh, my, uh, I love hearing uh, Ava's work. Um, so many wonderful poems, uh, especially the new ones. I love those too. Can't wait to see uh, the book that comes out of it. Um, so I, I do want to start with some poems that uh, are very early, two of them from, I think, my second book. And I think that um, they're pretty self-explanatory. The family that I grew up in was Greek, and we were the only Greeks in town, uh, which put us in a very strange position of not being quite white or black in a town where everybody was one or the other. Uh, my early work, I think, about the body was primarily elegiac. So I think the, the, the elegies that I wrote for others uh, evolved and my engagement with the body changed um, from elegy to a kind of fierceness of self. Body, earth, water. There's a tree and what I know is that some part of it is always dying. In every storm, another wing of cypress goes down. 
Though I tie my branch with knots of evil eye, I can count on a symmetry ruined by August, sure as the purple halls we plant and the saturated cane on the colored side of the parish. The rain makes windows in the ground and I know by now he'll step anywhere. I'm a girl with big long legs, ashamed of the way my brother lays himself out, partly submerged on the wavering roots of the cedar. I still have a thin white line tracing my right heel, split by the callus that rose up like a boat for the foot. Devil's work, says the woman, who warned against water's touch on my new female self. I fear for days my slip off the branch lacing the creek, that separation not so crucial. As years later, seeing mountains, I expected more height and a certain resolution. Landing in the cotton field in Washita, I see those windows flash their futile vacancies. Once I saw my brother take off his clothes to a whole afternoon's mutiny of light and rain. God help me from making a universe here. This will I give the water to fuse together and split apart. The punishing quadrant of the hurricane that never raged north of Baton Rouge. I'm looking for a form, a face that won't dissolve. Where's the boy, the woman, the red clay I learned to squeeze through my fist to clean it? She put that dirt in her mouth a hunger and anger nothing will take out of me. Some current still brings down the stand of Cyprus. Show me earth. That's what I say to my brother, though I know I give those trees their order. And nameless too, the fringe of vine and bird, the improvident cage woven around him. In the deep south, uh, catalpa trees, which we call down there catalp, catalpa trees, are prized because they harbor the catalpa worms that people fish with. And often my childhood, I'd have this recurring dream uh, of flying. And for some reason, it was always above these trees with these worms, <laughs> catalpa. My body woke whole and strong. The wings came out of nowhere, joined me to the birds swoop and dive above the sunken land. I could see the rim of watermark around each tree in the one recurring flight, catalpa trees, and Jeannie Bell's house just beyond. We collected worms from the ruts of trunks or as they hung like stamens of the long white flowers the trees put out each June. All around was the nasty smell of last year's leaves crushed underfoot. But in my double life, she and I flew above all that, above the entire grove planted for fishing bait. The pasty, gutsy worms loved by perch and bass sold up on the corner, the bait for her Sunday fish. On the bogged edge of Darbon Pond, filmed with the greenest green, where the bottom eaters doze, I'd see her with the others, black faces above the brimmed line of flowered dresses and hats bamboo poles arcing pale lines over the notched water. Quiet, not like us on the opposite manicured shore with our picnics and balls. This scene is real, I think. Sometimes I confuse them, the dream that is, and the actual fishing. I know the grove of catalpa trees from nights I sort in peace. She bore me up on her wide body. In that strange light, she shone. We were safe up there. I never doubted. I thought we shared some secret something in my blood, in my slow, white, half-breed blood. When I moved to the north, uh, the Louisiana landscape was replaced by the North Atlantic and the ocean, most specifically on the outer Cape, where I was lucky enough to spend some time in one of the historic dune shacks out there. 
moon snail. I killed it for its shell, its design and shape, not caring about the animal coiled inside, faceless mudworm, intestinal, with its amorphous foot fixed like a door to repel crabs or gulls. I thought I'd see some taut muscle, not that oozing, the giving over of a thick pulsing jelly wound and wound to its end. I didn't think of it answering to a clock hurling forward as the waves shoved onto sand, waiting to open and burrow, to feed before the water dragged it back. Traffic of the tides, that ugly life filled a house that took on hues of blue and rose, some pretty moss as it aged, perfect form spiraling to the innermost point marked by a round black eye. Five shells now, lined up by size, but not like Russian dolls, an amusing emptiness to fit a pattern. These are freed from their true selves, the disgusting, the lax, though I admit not evil, not what my grandmother warned against, the devil waiting for the opening praise provides. Spit, she said, in the face of beauty or truth to chase harm away. It's useless to spit in this ocean, always the churning surface and everything underneath riding in, polished by the sea's punishing thrust, empty shells survive. But I didn't want those. I chose the inhabited, the something there, and removed it. It's simple. I laid each one out in the blinding day. The sun did its work. The ants came. Then I shook it hard. And so the next poems I'm going to, poems I'm going to read are all from the new section of the book, um, I think. <laughs> The difference, terrifying to have oneself give way, old boat, which has carried me around, stubborn at the helm, self the great spirit finder, haphazard navigator, in the end, a hand dragging in the water. Energy, I thought, was her great strength, her voice chattering under the whip of wind. Meanwhile, out here in the complicity and amplitude, brazen in their plainness, fin and wind and wave are one moment of action. Hop takes off with a nestling, then the hammering dive of the plover's chase. Gull after gull drops the clam on the rocky flats and knows how to peck out the salty meat. Over and over, nature does one thing. And this is the difference. I, who have lived my life intent on direction, now I am blank. No destination after all. And she, who I called desire, called must and act, oh, goodbye. That idea striking me with her impertinence, her stone. Uh, one of the problems of Parkinson's is something called dyskinesia, which is uh, random movements uh, you can't control uh, of your arms, your legs, your hands. Um, and the next few poems have to do with that. Dyskinesia. The wind blew up and over, cold moved in. And that insisting note trained on the lip of a bottle, teasing me with something beautiful. May wind comes blooming, dark side of dove call, springs warning under the promise of light at 5 a.m. Something beneath birdsong flew the air through the flimsy windows and found me. First, it was a simple tapping, mysterious argument of my foot against the ancient floor, then my right side with its jerk 
the skinny flim flam dance, crazy arm, obeying whatever spirit had flown. Time now for my body's answer, the body inhabited. How could I not fall? Mother pain. Once in the vast middle of pain, pain stopped and a certain clarity descended. In the sudden effortlessness of being, I could forget the body. I stayed perfectly still, caught up in wanting it to last, this unexpected innocence born of the body's permission. Minutes passed before I could move and pain came riding back rising and twisting, this time trying to throw me across the room. She was a big wind coming through windows I couldn't close, turning over the orchids I loved, splattering the dirt. If she wanted, I'd be on the floor weeks later, still falling, and she'd bring the walker in to stay to remind me she owned it all. I was just furniture that needed dumping. I was a dropped clock and time had turned to serve her. My every second belonged to her. She said, just die. Submission is not such a terrible thing. She knew how to play me out with her pills, her bribes. I give up, I said. And that was how she knew she could release me for those minutes. And I could be my own country in charge of my little self the thinking and planning that had once been the sum of me. Later, I could see how this leniency was only to show how easy it was for her to get me back. Mother, I cried and cursed my infant cries. Arm, etc. Arm has become its own machine stuck on the job of reaching all the rules broken in some other language dragged from the depths. The brain's got secrets that even Arm doesn't know. Arm no longer cares for anything Hand might want to do, and Hand gets pulled along. Sullen child, poor Hand caught in a vise, stiffened by its throb and the drum. Arm still insisting, holding Hand behind my back mad tap tapping to keep from being dragged away. What a story, me walking with a stick along, along the beloved beach, an arm refuses, starts up directing the waves, flying out in the good beach air as we all try to look away. Can't stop, says hand, can't balance, leg says. This is how the body wakes me up and this is how she knocks me down. This sorrow is all about my mother. Did I not believe her stuttered spoon to mouth, soup on the floor, her level black eyes entering me? She could slap my face now, hand could, in this boring chorus of saying. But sometimes hand flies up to pat my shoulder or curls close by my side, Pretends to sleep, sweet pet, doesn't want arm to make me weep. Then when I start to forget, hand runs off, slams the glass, the plate, the sink. And as for the little slave fingers in the grab, they just let go. Being apart. Again, some new curiosity turns me this way and that. If I leave for a few minutes, the world changes, resisting my hold on time. It is a planet after all, with its own moon and the night's business to do. I catch myself wondering how to say goodbye, but I'm tired of goodbyes, as I'm tired of trying to resist. The infinite variety of the same wakes me every day, this illness that makes me see myself apart from all the rest. Around me, there is always more. At this moment, jackhammers clatter away in the street 
as a hulking machine lays down new pavement over cracks and holes. So much work to keep us from falling. And it's comforting to go into the water at its peak. I've seen the bottom. I know it's there as I know the submerged rocks, the exact location of the boulders decided row. I could be shoved against them, thrown. Tonight under the tropical sky, colors of a bruise, the indifferent ongoing tide shuffles in one hour at a time. Uh, now I'm going to read one more poem, my last poem um, uh, in the book, actually. It's from uh, White Sea. Uh, no, it's from Book of Dog, I guess. Survival, a guide. It's not easy living here, waiting to be charmed by the first little scribble of green. Even in May, crows want to own the place, and the heron old bent thing spends hours looking like graying bark, part of a dead trunk lying over opaque water. She strikes the pose so long I begin to think she's determined to make herself into something ordinary. The small lakes continue their slide into bog and muck. Remember when they ran clear, an invisible spring renewing the water? But the ducks stay longer amusing ruffle and chatter, I can be distracted. If I do catch her move, the heron appears to have no particular fear or hunger, her gaunt body hinged haphazardly, a few gears unlocking one wing than another. More than a generation here and every year more drab. Once I called her blue heron, as in great blue, part of a book, true to a book, part myth, part childhood's color. Older now, I see her plain, a mere surviving against the weedy bank with fox dens and the ruthless overhead patrol. Some blind clockwork keeps her going. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, thank you so very much. That was fantastic. We have a, uh, some wonderful questions that we can ask. Uh, Eva, are you uh, available? I can ask a couple questions to both of you if you'd like. Um, yes. Yes, I'm here. Hey, welcome back. Um, <laughs> so uh, we have a few questions, just time for a couple questions from the audience. We have uh, um, Someone would like to hear both of you talk about your creative process, if it changes from book to book, if you write by hand or if you write on a computer um, and uh, how you get inspiration. Uh, everyone would like to hear that. Let's start in the order in which you presented. So we'll go Ava and then Cleopatra, if you could just talk for a little bit about your creative process. Yes, and can you hear me? Yes, okay, good. Uh, so yes, thank you for this question actually. It is a complicated answer because I'm a non-native, so I used to write in Polish a bit differently than I what I what I do in English. And the way I came to write in English actually was a bit through a mistranslation. What happened is when my first book uh, came out in Poland, I was already doing my PhD in US. I wasn't really there in Poland. And my local friends, colleagues wanted to see it in English. So I started to translate it with another colleague and I got bored and I started to mistranslate it. And uh, that's how I came to write in English. And then I took, uh, my PhD was in English, but I took one creative writing course and that encouraged me. But so to write in English is less automatic than it was to write in Polish and it's more deliberate in a sense, I can't take anything for granted. So I uh, am a bit at the mercy of language mistakes, but also at the mercy of others, which is beautiful because, uh, you know, I relate to others when I write. So whenever I finish manuscript, like I have amazing group of poets who helped me. So I send it to one group or the other. And uh, uh, I, um, basically write through concepts. So let's say um, 
of enunciations, I was a bit obsessed with migration crisis. So that was propelling me. So I was researching, reading, watching documentaries and stuff. And then with Contraband of Hupo, I went to Ellis Island and took notes. So another thing I do is I take notes a lot. So I used to carry a lot of notebooks. Now I also use computer, whatever is easier. But um, I think uh, part of my writing is a bit conceptual, that once I have an idea, I just explore it to the point of exhaustion. And that helps me somehow with, uh, because sometimes when you are a non-native writer, you feel vicarious, the language. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's more or less my process. A lot of revision is, is involved. Uh, probably much more than I would have ever done when I was writing in Polish. Well, thank you so much for that eloquent thank answer. You. Your books are very focused, so that makes sense that you would get caught up mm. on, an, on an idea like that yeah. and a concept. Uh, uh, Cleopatra, what about you? What is your uh, creative process like? Does it, is there a process? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to write by hand. I used to keep uh, many journals, uh, a writing journal and a journal in which I wrote other things. And I, I would go back and forth from journal to journal. I have a real fear of a blank sheet of paper. And whenever I sat down to write, I like to have uh, some journal entry, something that I wrote down maybe in the middle of the night, um, something that you know, is on a piece of paper or on the back of the New Yorker, or uh, I, I always had fragments from the one journal. Then I had incidents that I generally kept in the other journal. Unfortunately, I've always been really involved with my handwriting. I always loved my handwriting. And that encouraged me to keep the writing journals, I think. Um, in the last 10 years, it's been very difficult for me because my handwriting is now awful. And Parkinson's has made my handwriting completely illegible in a lot of ways. I still make notes on various sheets of paper, uh, post-its, and, you know, keep them, you know, in, in a notebook, I suppose you'd say. But I don't feel very confident uh, in terms of sitting down and writing uh, you know, longhand. So I've been trying to write on the computer. <laughs> I have something called voice recognition software, which is a kind of joke because it's meant for business people, I think. Uh, it, it's really kind of funny. The, it's impossible to write a poem with voice recognition software because it keeps correcting you. And it doesn't even recognize, as far as I can tell, not with my accent anyway, does not recognize the word poem. It writes power or like, pornography. Or, it sounds like, a, it sounds like a poem in itself that your oh, voice yeah. recognition software wants. That's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, it's not, it has not been easy uh, to try to make a, a switch, especially because I wrote the way I wrote. My process was the same for many, many years. And to change that process has been very difficult. Um, however, you know, I, I'm trying to uh, find some good in it. Um, I'm doing more drafts now on the computer. I, I have a few friends who I'm very attached to, who I, I show almost all my work to. Um, That's I, wonderful. My my uncle is a poet, and he said that he, like he he has some shakes now in his in his mid seventies, but he's he's uh, the the act of moving his hand, he says, is just so much better for activating the mind than than typing on fingers or talking out loud. So um, even if he can't read it, sometimes it just helps to get it out. He said so. Right. Uh, the uh, I have one last question. Um, if I can end on a on a somewhat serious question for both of you, um, both of you seem to look deeply at dark subjects. Um, and while I was listening to both of you read, I thought of uh, 
uh, Stanley Kunitz, the testing tree. And, uh, you know, it, uh, he, um, you know, ends that poem in part with, uh, mm -hmm. in a murderous time, the heart breaks and breaks and lives by breaking. It is necessary to go through dark and deeper dark and not to turn. And I would love to hear both of you talk about um, how you, um, how important it is for you to look and walk through and go through the darkness uh, to get to the truth in your poems. Um, if we could, uh, if Ava's still there, I will start with her. If not, uh, Cleopatra, we can start with you. Yes, I'm here. I can. Mm. I just wanted to say, Cleopatra, I'm so mesmerized by your poems and the last poem, Heron, and was just, you just, just blew me away. But all of them were so moving and I, I just want to study them and um, revel in them. And um, just uh, with, uh, I think a lot of the themes come, come from my upbringing in Poland, from, you know, that I grew up in the communist regime and uh, grew up um, reading Herbert, Miłosz, Zagajewski, and these were the poets who would say poetry, you know, was it, just like Flannery O'Connor or Dostoevsky, beauty will save the world, right? Uh, and uh, that poetry should be like bread for the hungry. So part of me, uh, you know, somehow stays faithful, even if the words take me somewhere else or I'm being silly on page, I somehow deep inside have this uh, root belief in me. Um, and uh, just maybe, you know, like Paul Stellan used to talk about poetry, that poets are those who are wounded by reality and they recreate or they, they create a new reality. So I, I think we are all wounded. I think we are all exiles. And I think, it, you know, my desire through my poetry is to keep the, the wound open somehow and not to mask it, or not to get rid of it. Um, so, so I think that that's what drives me. Plus, I think just uh, bumpy life, maybe. <laughs> that's why I'm more in tune with suffering. Um, I actually treasure suffering, not that I want it, but I think it's such an inherent part of everybody's life and particularly writers' lives. They are maybe, uh, they open themselves to, to dwell in it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your honesty. I really appreciate it. Cleopatra, what, uh, how do you, um, how important is looking into the darkness and the suffering for, for your work? Well, I thought it was wonderful that you quoted those lines because uh, Kunitz was my teacher and my first mentor. And uh, those, those lines are amazingly important to me. It is necessary to go through dark and deeper dark and not to turn. And certainly Stanley Kunitz lived his life that way. And as a teacher, he, he drilled that into us. Uh, and when he went during our workshops and when he looked at my poems, he had this way of going, he would take his finger and he would go to a line buried in the poem that you had hardly recognized when you wrote it down. And he'd say, there's something here you're not telling us, you know? So it was to go through the experience and find the nexus, to find the heart of the experience. Um, and that was a huge lesson uh, for me because I think as a young person, I didn't want to face my own adversity. And, you know, you if you're an optimistic person, and I was pretty optimistic, there was always this tendency to want to bury uh, the emotional importance of the poem. And he taught me to go after it, to look for it. And I, I suppose that does mean that there is trouble, <laughs> trouble at the heart. Well, thank you so much. I didn't know your connection to Stanley Kunitz and I, uh, what a wonderful anecdote. Thank you so very much. And uh, 
that's all we have time for. So thank you so very much. You can uh, mute and uh, turn off your microphone and, and stuff if you want or wave to people, but uh, I'm gonna finish my announcements here. So, uh, well, that about does it for us folks. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again to our partners, Mascoma Bank, the Norman Williams Public Library and the Yankee Bookshop. Thank you to our moderator, Madel Driscoll and a big virtual round of applause to tonight's poets, Eva Cruchel and Cleopatra Mathis. Thank you so very much for both of you for being here tonight. If you need to Thank contact you. us, you're welcome. Uh, if you need to contact us, please visit us at bookstockvt.org or email us at info at bookstockvt.org. And finally, thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. Stay safe and good night. <laughs>